So here I'm sharing a case of complicated diverticulitis. The patient's had numerous attacks and now has developed a fistula uh, likely to the left fallopian tube, as well as what looks like on MRI, a fistula to the cervix. Um, so she elected for resection. Here I've just separated the appendix off. It looked like I might have injured it a little bit, so I'm doing a quick appendectomy. I'm just using the bipolar and scissors to come through the mesentery and to clean off the base of the appendix. And then in the interest of cost, I'm just gonna do a suture ligation or a, a simple tie with a zero silk. Do two of these. And then just divide the appendix and remove it. Now we'll move on with the medial to lateral dissection. I actually like leaving uh, the attachments, these lateral um, fibrotic and inflammatory adhesions um, attached to the sidewall because it kind of serves as um, natural retraction. And usually the, the retroperitoneal plane is unviolated by the inflama inflammatory response. So I'll just go ahead and do a medial to lateral. And here we're going to start um, coming out and underneath the superior hemorrhoidal vessel um, and looking for the ureter. That's just a big inflamed lymph node there. And right there is the ureter. You'll see in a little bit why I really like um, ICG and the ureters. Here I'm trying to dissect down into the pelvis and the ureter is really intimately involved in this inflammatory reaction and being able to um, keep an ICG mode, you can really do a meticulous dissection without concern for injury. It's getting really stuck there, so now I'm just going to go isolate the superior hemorrhoidal vessel. I like to really clean this off. Um, just so that you've isolated the vessel completely. That way there's really no concerns at all taking this with the vessel sealer without extra wads of tissue in there. And now we'll continue our medial to lateral dissection. As I said, usually the retroperitoneal plane is unviolated as you can see here. Once I've adequately done a, my medial dissection, I leave a sponge underneath there to keep the ureter posterior. Um, and now I'm going to do some lateral dissection. Not shown in this video was that I did a full lateral dissection, including mobilization of the splenic flexure in order to gain length for the anastomosis, as this anastomosis was much lower than a standard sigmoid. Here I'm just going to join the previous medial dissection. You see the sponge there. And I'm going to try to dissect down towards the um, left pelvic brim where it's really, really stuck. And you'll see later on how challenging this part of the dissection becomes. Trying to do as much of this bluntly um, to get into uh, the true plane. Um, but this just proved really, really challenging due to the chronic inflammation. Obviously, these operations can be done laparoscopically. I find that with the strength of the robotic arms to be able to get the torque that we're getting here um, for retraction, um, robotic in my hands is a lot easier. Because it got really stuck there, I decided to go do some pelvic uh, dissection. There I just freed the right tube and ovary. I'm seeing how there's a loop of sigmoid stuck way down deep into the pelvis and really adherent to the back of the uterus and the cervix really having a lot of trouble with that part of the dissection so i'm just kind of doing this bluntly with the suction device which really works nicely these operations are not always very glamorous you can see it becomes bloody at certain points um, i don't think there's really much that you can do about that now that i freed up the uterus a little bit i'm going to go ahead and suspend it
this frees up the uh, the first arm number one for, for retraction. And now I'm continuing to work way down deep in the pelvis. And again, the MRI suggested that there was a separate fistula down here um, from the loop of sigmoid to either the cervix or upper vagina. Um, I didn't really come across much granulation tissue in this area, so I'm not sure if that was just adherence or a true fistula. But clearly there was a fistula to the left fallopian tube, and you'll see that in a little bit. Here's some granulation tissue associated with that fistula. And here I'm finally finding a plane um, lateral and inferior to the left fallopian tube and ovary. And I'm just trying to bluntly free this up. Um, and I can finally see here um, the, uh, the left tube and ovary stuck to the medial aspect of the sigmoid colon. And I finally got my suction device around that uh, fallopian tube. So I'm just going to divide this and take the tube and ovary on block with the colon. This opens up um, that left pelvic brim where I was really stuck before and is going to facilitate dissection, just cleaning things up with the suction. Coming down deep in the pelvis, um, this is just the colon stuck to the anterior peritoneal reflection. Um, just showing, you know, she clearly uh, had an abscess down deep in there and causing some inherence. Um, this is just separating that uh, distal sigmoid loop from the peritoneal reflection. Again, I don't think that there was truly a fistula down here. I think it was just stuck from the, uh, the abscess in the rind. Now this is the area that I was having trouble with before and concerns with where the ureter was and I'm just going to carve through this with the uh, scissors for right now because I really can't find a good plane. I'm trying to air towards the colon to make sure that I'm not bringing any of the left pelvic sidewall, any of the branches of the internal iliac into my plane of dissection. And here I can finally see a little bit better, but I'm still just doing as much blunt dissection as I can making sure I don't have any thermal spread to the ureter. And then finishing this off with the ligature. There was a little bit of bleeding from the sidewall there. You'll see later on, I just put a surgicil on that for the remainder of the operation. And um, when I was done, the bleeding there had stopped. So now I finally have gotten that loop of sigmoid out of the pelvis, so I'm going to go ahead and take my distal rectal mesentery and clean off where I, I want to transect distally. This is um, uh, actually much lower than you standard would for a sigmoid resection. Um, the anastomosis ends up being just above the peritoneal reflection. It was necessary to take the upper rectum as it was really scarred in and damaged with the uh, disease. Now I'll go ahead and take the proximal mesentery. As I said, I previously had taken down the entire splenic flexure. Um, and uh, actually later, after I'm doing what I'm doing right now, I actually went up ahead and took the IMV right at the duodenum in order to get adequate length. Um, I just edited that out for time. But after having done these maneuvers, I had more than adequate length to reach for basically a, a distal colorectal anastomosis. Always check perfusion. I make a mark uh, with the cautery so that I know where to divide once the ICG has washed out. And I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And then I'll divide distal. I had chosen to do an intracorporeal anastomosis here. Um, I did not want to use, I did not want to do a transrectal extraction because I was very concerned about that distal rectum. Um, getting torn and I knew that it was going to be very challenging to chop up that specimen into smaller pieces so I decided to just do 
a hand-sewn anastomosis, uh, which has become uh, my routine. I will go ahead and suture the two posterior, the two staple lines together to be an outer posterior layer. I'm checking perfusion again to make sure I'm happy, which I am. And then I'll make a proctotomy with scissors and a colotomy with the scissors. And then I'll suture, this is the inner back row with a 3 ob lock starting in the middle and suturing out around the left hand side. You've seen me do this in a lot uh, of my other videos. Um, this is not the prettiest demonstration of this anastomosis as it's much deeper in the pelvis and the bowel edges look pretty ratty. Um, but I'm just suturing um, out around the left side of the anastomosis. Uh, right here I'm turning the needle around so that now it's on the outside. And now I'm going to go ahead and start in the middle and suture towards the right side. And then I'm turning that needle around uh, just for the better, better angle. And then we're just going to do a baseball stitch um, coming over the top. So this is the inner anterior row. You can slow this part down in YouTube if you'd like to see it a little bit closer, but again, I, I have uh, many other better demonstrations of this anastomosis than what you're seeing here. And then I usually will just tie these two sutures together for additional security. And we'll take that original 3 OV lock um, that sutured the posterior row, and we're going to come around anterior with it to limbert that um, inner suture line. And just for additional security to make sure that I've got that whole corner closed because you can see it's kind of tough to see exactly where the anastomosis is and where the bowel keeps on going, I will always suture all the way out to that silk um, because I know that that silk is beyond the anastomosis. And then I will tie uh, the V-lock to the silk so that I know 100% that it's closed. Anastomosis is done. Now we're going to do our leak test and I um, will go up and through the anastomosis with the 19 millimeter proctoscope so that I know that it's patent. Um, I also did a vaginoscopy and I didn't see any defects in the, uh, the vagina and I felt like I had really good distension here and no bubbles so I conclude the operation at this point. Uh, patient did well, discharged on post-operative day two. Thank you for watching.